All right, so it's just about eight o'clock, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, we're really delighted to have Dr. Michael Gibson join us uh, this morning for Cardiology Grand Rounds. Um, Dr. Gibson is uh, no stranger to most of us. He is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and an interventional uh, cardiologist in our division. Dr. Gibson uh, leads the BAME and um, Perfuse uh, research groups where uh, he has led um, many, many clinical trials ranging from phase one to four, um, and the institutes overall have, have led over 1,000 studies. Um, Dr. Gibson, uh, in addition to his um, expertise in clinical trials, is also uh, renowned for his work on Wikidoc, um, an open source uh, textbook uh, resource, and um, has a, a very powerful presence on um, social media. Um, so we're really delighted to have him speak about the democratization of medicine um, and the intersection with uh, social media and digital health. Um, before I get started, just to let you know, if I do um, turn off your camera so that we can maximize the number of participants so that we don't overwhelm Zoom. Um, so if you notice that your camera is off, that, that's probably me. Um, all right, well, thank you so much, Mike. Great, well, thanks for having me. Uh, today, we're talking about the democratization of medicine. What does that mean? Well, what we're going to talk about is how culture and science uh, intersect, how culture changes science and science leads to changes in culture. We have serious problems with access uh, throughout the country uh, with respect to a lot of things, but what we're going to talk about today is access to information, how that's changing, and how it's, uh, I think, improving uh, patient care, and in particular, how it's changing how we conduct uh, clinical trials. My disclosures are shown here, uh, really only disclosure related to one of the big trials I'm running, uh, the Heartline trial funded by Apple and Johnson & Johnson. Well, a few years ago, uh, I was asked by JAMA to write an editorial piece about the democratization of uh, medical research and education. Uh, there are a lot of advantages, there are a lot of perils. Uh, as I said before, a lot of this has to do with access. And I grew up uh, in Oklahoma, uh, spent a lot of time uh, in a town called Stillwell, Oklahoma, and access was and is, and probably will continue to be, a problem for Stillwell. Uh, you know, it was a town uh, with dirt roads and one uh, intersection with a stoplight. Uh, and uh, my grandmother and grandfather ran a uh, uh, auto repair store and my heroes were stock car drivers and my goal in life was to become a stock car driver. Um, and, you know, my grandmother, when I told her I was up here at Harvard and doing what I was doing and not making a lot of money, keep in mind when I was CC director at the BI, I was making $60,000 a year just to kind of level set your expectations as junior faculty members. And my grandmother said, what are you doing? You know, if you were back down here at home, you could be like your cousin Marty. He drives stock cars on the Friday nights and he makes like five or six times what you're making. This is ridiculous. But anyway, uh, Stillwell has problems with access. Uh, they have problems with healthcare access. Uh, Stillwell was the uh, worst ranked town in the United States for life expectancy, a life expectancy of 57 years. And a lot of this has to do with lack of access uh, to medical care. Another thing we lacked access to, and probably still lack some access to, uh, is information. My grandmother gave me a nickel and she told me, go down the street and buy yourself a book at the book fair. Well, there was a whole encyclopedia there and I just picked out one volume. That's all I could afford was the letter C. And at that moment in time, when I read that book at night, I was completely up to date for everything that was going on in the world that began with the letter C in 1927. Uh, so not a lot of access. Um, and the good news though, is I think the internet has improved things. So a lot more people have access. We're gonna talk about how we're moving trials away from being at a hospital, which limits access, to being done virtually. Uh, so that people in Stillwell, Oklahoma uh, can participate. Well, many of you know, uh, I'm an artist, I paint a lot. 
Uh, my mother was an artist. Uh, the thing you may not know is that when I was young, in my teenage years, as a 16-year-old, and this is insane, I can't believe they did this, the local newspaper actually reached out to me and hired me uh, to be a reporter. So my first real job, uh, aside from mowing lawns and everything else a kid does, was working uh, as a newspaper reporter. And that love of reporting uh, and journalism has stuck with me. And you can see I've always been interested at, in the intersection of science, culture, and society. And in fact, one of my favorite classes uh, at the University of Chicago was in fact called Science, Culture, and Society. And we studied a lot how culture impacts science and how science uh, impacts culture. And we're gonna do a kind of in-depth dive into uh, this and see how that plays out in our modern era. Well, when I went to medical school, I was continuing to be an artist. I drew a lot of Gray's uh, anatomy. My son discovered this in a shoebox and was dumbfounded uh, by what I'd done. And I was a little bit like a monk. You know, I was sitting there uh, drawing and recording things by hand on paper. But of course, everything changed uh, in the 80s, late 70s, 80s. My first computer was a TRS-80 from Radio Shack, two kilobytes of memory. Then I rocketed right up to uh, you know, an IBM computer in the 80s, and that changed everything. When we moved from paper to computers, it really dramatically changed the educational landscape and how we shared information. You guys are too young to remember, back when Grand Rounds was given, an expert was a person from Boston with two slide carousels. We don't have slide carousels anymore. But when we did have slide carousels, the person who owned the carousel owned the slides and they owned the content. Uh, and they really couldn't share their content even if they wanted. But with the development of PowerPoint, you no longer had to go down to that guy in the basement who drew all the figures for you at an enormous cost, I might add. And you had over control over the content. You could also share the content and you could share it electronically. And we didn't have to have the physicality of those slides and the ownership of those slides. And so at the beginning of the dot-com era, when I was in San Francisco, I set up a website where we could share all these slides. It was called clinicaltrialresults.org. And on the first day, 10,000 people downloaded slides uh, that I had put up. And it was clear to me that this was gonna be a very powerful way of educating people. And things were going great, uh, but then I got a phone call uh, from a major journal saying, you know, you just can't take the data from tables and you can't just make up a bar graph. We own the data, we own the mode of display of the data, and you're in violation of copyright. And you know, if you didn't publish with us, we would sue you for copyright violation. I also got another call from a medical society saying something similar, and then they stripped all of our names for many of the people who submitted their slides, put the society name on them, and copyrighted them. Uh, and they too threatened to sue me for copyright violation. I put that letter up in my office just to show people and framed it just to show people how you do not collaborate. And then a research fellow said to me, why is it costing me hundreds of dollars to get the PDFs of the articles that I'd published with you? So it got me thinking about, you know, that monk who had originally created work for very rich patrons, just one copy, and what copyright was and who owns the content and why. Well, copyright began uh, long ago. It began with the printing press. And when you had the development of the printing press, suddenly you could have the dissemination of large volumes of printed work, some of which could be uh, critical of the English government and could be viewed as seditious. So the king decided, well, we can't have people distributing thousands of copies of things that are bad-mouthing me. Uh, so he created, uh, people who would review the work, and they had to have the right to copy the work. And that's where the word copyright comes from. It's essentially a censoring law uh, from the beginning of the printing press. Uh, the government allowed a private company 
uh, what you see here on the left to uh, review all this, uh, to have the right to confiscate the work, to burn work that was uh, illegally printed. And uh, the books were entered into a registry under the publishing company's name, not under the author's name who created the work. So really early copyright law protected two things. It protected the business model of the copyright or copy press owner, and it protected uh, the government. But after a while, uh, people told the king he had to uh, loosen up. He did loosen up, uh, but the protection of the person who owned the means of distribution, the person who owned the printing press remain protected. And that's why we have had copyright law ever since. So in that old world order, uh, you had a high cost of creation and distribution of content on paper. This limited the flow of information, really mostly to those people at the top who could afford the access. And that was the copyright world. But now we're more in a world where the distribution of con uh, content is nearly free, the storage is nearly free, uh, the means of production are very, very uh, inexpensive. And that's why we are shifting to what I've called a copy left world. Now, copy left isn't just a cute name with a cute logo. It actually is a formal legal doctrine uh, which protects the content uh, from being owned by any one person. Uh, that content uh, should be freely accessible forever. All you have to do is give credit uh, to the person who uh, originally uh, created the content. And uh, for 15 years now, we've been using a copyleft platform to create an open access textbook. Uh, about 2,200 physicians have come and volunteered here in Boston. Uh, there's about 135,000 chapters or micro chapters. 1200 patient chapters and it's been edited uh, millions of times we also have about 16,000 board review questions so it's been a very very successful model i'm very pleased with what we have uh, created we also use this as part of our clinical trials now to uh, educate people this open access movement is broadening now in europe uh, there is plan s where uh, if you receive funding from any of the entities you see listed here, uh, the material must be free and open. Uh, so I think you will see a growing, growing trend towards uh, open access. And that's very important because the people who wanna look at this content are not just physicians. They're also uh, lay people who also wanna understand and read about what we're doing. So the world has changed. The internet started off as a, an internet 1.0 platform where there was this one direction of information flow. But now in an internet 2.0 world, there's bi-directional flow of information. It's participatory. Everyone has a voice now on social media. Uh, people may not like that, um, but uh, it's important that people have access and have a voice. Now I was, very skeptical, and I didn't get on social media platforms. But then my son, uh, Will, convinced me that, Dad, you got to get on Twitter. And I got on Twitter. My one and only follower at first, I want to give a shout out to him, was Deepak Bhatt. Uh, he was it. But uh, I gained some followers slowly. But then the Boston Marathon came, and uh, my son texted me. He said, Dad, I'm OK. And he had just run the marathon like he did many years. And I texted back, well, you must be tired. And he said, no, dad, you don't get it. A bomb just went off around the corner from our house. And uh, I then was on call that day, went down to the emergency room. There wasn't a lot I could do. But what I could do was tell uh, people what was going on um, and kind of became what I've called a citizen journalist or a citizen reporter. Uh, and created hashtags like, I'm okay, to let people know in your family that you're okay. Created an emergency dial-in number so people could see, is my relative in the BI uh, emergency room? And it became very clear to me, uh, after I was contacted by media outlets throughout the world, that this was gonna be a very powerful way uh, for people to communicate uh, about what was going on in the world. 
this trend has just continued to explode. Um, you know, on the left here, I think you can see that photographers have had a tough time of it. Now uh, everyone is a photographer out there and providing uh, their images. And now all of you, if you want to, as physicians, uh, can either become a physician, journalist, or reporter, or a citizen, uh, reporter, or journalist, and really contribute uh, to what's going on. There has been a decline in traditional media. Traditional media is not going away. Certainly how it is distributed has changed dramatically uh, from a paper format to an electronic format. How people digest the news and get the news has changed very dramatically. Uh, people really rely much more now on uh, social media uh, to get their information. And this is continuing to change uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. Very dramatically in the midst of a pandemic, uh, it really has been very important. Uh, I would say much of the traditional media is relying on social media for access to information. And during this period of time, I think you've seen a continued rise of the physician and citizen journalist. I think you've seen lots of people around the world contribute their ideas of how to make a mask or how to make a ventilator, uh, how to prevent your glasses from fogging up. Uh, so you have a lot of citizen scientists and a lot of citizen innovators. Uh, it really has been a hotbed of activity for physician and citizen activist, as I'm going to show you. And for all of you who are clinician educators, uh, this is a very important way that you can educate other physicians uh, and your patients. I think a big part of the open access movement has been the development of uh, preprint servers. Uh, I'm very proud of my good friend uh, who was a former BI uh, fellow who sat next to me for four years in the fellows room, Harlan Krumholtz. Uh, also a big believer in the open access movement and open data movement. Uh, Harlan uh, and his colleagues have worked with others to create preprint servers. I would say preprint servers have rightly or wrongly, you can have your criticisms of them, have had a tremendous impact during the pandemic on getting information out there quicker. One of the problems is that the traditional media and others may view them as having been peer reviewed. The word peer reviewed, I think, is taking on new meaning. Uh, traditionally, peer review means that it's been reviewed by a select, small number of experts, uh, some of whom have competing conflicts of interest. That can be good and that can be bad. For me, peer review means global peer review, where everyone has had an ex uh, opportunity to look at the content review it, comment on it. You will see in a moment how the comments can actually be very useful. But I'm sad to say that this week, the Annals of Internal Medicine uh, indicated that it does not support preprints. So some journals do, uh, some major journals do. I hope other journals will uh, begin to support uh, the preprint service. Now you might say, and this is what has been said by many of my generation, is that, well, you know, Twitter's and social media is great, it's rapid, it's uh, all that, but there's no peer review. What do you mean? It's being seen by people all over the world. They're making their comments. Um, I think it's important that they're not commenting anonymously uh, for the most part. Here's an example where uh, an investigator reported that CRISPR babies have a shortened lifespan by 20% potentially. But taking the same data set, another expert went in and showed that that just wasn't the case. And all this transpired after publication of the article within 24 hours. So here you have an article that's published and quote, peer reviewed by experts but then gets global peer review by a much larger group of experts and is essentially rejected. I think we need to rethink the ways that we are uh, reviewing content and I think we need to make it much more global uh, and accessible. Uh, I do think um, as physicians, we have become um, much more uh, 
in the way of advocates as well. This article that I was pointing out uh, here, this was a preprint put up there by the University of Nebraska showing that there's the potential uh, for the coronavirus, at least the RNA particles, to be spread by an aerosolized route. And this was a big part of what the uh, Academy of National Sciences sent to the president saying, look, there's an article in the New England Journal showing that it can be aerosolized, it can be in the air for three hours. Here is another article from Nebraska where people are originally sent showing that it comes out of the room, the negative pressure room, out of the negative pressure room into the hallway and into the ventilation ducts by an aerosolized route and people aren't coughing, they're just talking. And this preprint information coupled with the New England Journal information was very important in reshaping the debate about whether you need a mask or not. Myself and others were big advocates of uh, the idea that we may all need to mask up like they've done uh, in the Eastern world. Uh, so I was, uh, I was uh, very, very uh, aggressive in promoting this kind of information and promoting the use of a, a mask. You can see uh, I put a lot of polls up, 94% uh, of people saying they thought we should move to masks. This has really been a chance where you as a physician or an educator can be an advocate. And it's also a, a moment where you as a physician or educator can make a difference. And one person can make a difference. So when you look at the uh, people who were listed as influencers by Simpler, they count up how many people you reach and how often your message is spread and uh, retweeted. Uh, WHO was in first place, uh, CDC was second, but you can see a single person, a physician acting as a patient advocate uh, can also rise and uh, have a, a voice that is as strong as some of these organizations. Social media will not replace traditional media. Uh, I think it supplements or complements traditional media. I've been on uh, traditional media a lot lately on TV. Uh, functioning as both a patient advocate and as an educational resource. So I think these are both going to complement each other rather than compete with each other. Again, I, one of the things I did was create a hashtag called MacGyver Care, where we could all put up our ideas about how we can innovate to improve things. Uh, and uh, it was fun to watch that kind of take off. It was fun to even hear it on uh, national TV, that term, MacGyver Care. This is some content I put up about different materials and how good they are with masks. You can see my homemade mask over on the right. Um, people had a lot of fun naming uh, me and my mask after a Star Wars character. But again, uh, when I work with the CDC and AHA, it's very powerful. You can reach large numbers of people, 127 million people in an hour, if you work together and use uh, this very powerful medium. In terms of patient access and patient advocacy, I think this has really played out amazingly during the pandemic. Uh, I was uh, contacted by a patient family member asking, could you help us get access uh, to uh, the Gilead drug from Desivere? And I worked with Gilead, contacted them, worked with them, made the way up the ranks to get this patient um, compassionate use. You can see on the bottom left, they said, thanks the next day. And then uh, the patient got better, was discharged from the hospital and thanked me for uh, their outcomes. And this whole process of patient advocacy, patients having a voice, connecting to someone in healthcare, connecting to a scientist was featured uh, two weekends ago uh, in um, the New York Times and I was interviewed for that. So. This is very important. Uh, you know, patients are really reaching out and advocating for themselves now and are not just being a passive member of the uh, process. There are some other tools that you as physicians that they can use.
tags. You can also use hashtags. You can use a hashtag like what I've called plasma for coronavirus. With this, Peter can say, look, I've had coronavirus. I'm in Boston, Massachusetts. And then a family member or someone can search plasma for coronavirus and then the city Boston and everyone had who has put their name up uh, or a Twitter handle up rather will appear in that search. Uh, so again, a way that you can help guide and connect patients uh, to resources. Finally, uh, as an artist, I did donate some of my work uh, and uh, I just put it out there, but then as you can see in the upper right hand here, uh, one of my uh, Twitter followers wrote and said, well, let's auction it off. And uh, we raised $25,000 for charity for PPE. He's gonna auction it again uh, to uh, a group of investors to raise even more money, all of which going to uh, provide PPE. So to kind of summarize, I think we've seen a new world order where we moved from a very insular secretive world to now a much more open source world where things are not innovated just within companies but are innovated across companies. Uh, there's much more flow of information to everyone. We've moved from paper to the internet and this is largely but not exclusively good. Uh, there are limitations. You have to be very careful. Uh, you think all of this is a free commodity, but you are actually the commodity. Uh, when you do a Google search, you think you're doing a Google search, but actually Google is searching you. Uh, you have to be careful. Uh, and when you think you're playing Pokemon Go, Pokemon Go is really playing you. It's directing you to establishments like McDonald's, Starbucks, et cetera. So I think you have to be careful. You have to be aware of what's called surveillance capitalism and how your information, your data is being used to influence you. And as the data scientists say, we learned how to write the music uh, and now we have learned how to make them dance by targeting you with that information at vulnerable moments and times. Well, things have also changed in terms of organization. Uh, things were much more siloed in the past and much more global now. Things were much more vertical in command and control. Now they're much more flat. Uh, but for today's purposes, I think one of the biggest change has been the change from a patient being a passive member in the care process to being an active member and to having a seat uh, at uh, the table. We've moved from being trusted providers who convey information in, I would say, in some ways, a paternalistic manner. Uh, it's prescriptive in the past. The patient was uninformed. It was a one-way conversation. Now, uh, much to some of our chagrin, the people, it seems like they're almost coming to us for a second opinion from Google, but we have to earn the trust of our patients uh, they are now more informed and knowledgeable, and now it's a conversation, uh, and it's a two-way conversation. Now, when you roll all this up, this really sets the stage for what I'm calling giga trials. If you want to do a trial of 180,000 patients, it's going to take patient empowerment to get the job done. So. The GIGA trial is where all of this work of providing open access, providing access irrespective of geography and provider comes together. Uh, it's where social media comes together. It's where the electronic health records and all the insurance claims data come together. It's where patient empowerment, including patient compensation for the work that they are doing in their participation, wearables and big data and apps all come together uh, to create what I'm calling the giga trial. When I was younger, <clears throat> when I was your age as a fellow, uh, everything was done with paper and uh, you know we had kilobytes of data. 
Then we began to do some single sender work, particularly at the BI, right at the beginning of the birth of the stent era. Uh, all of us were very involved in this, uh, people like myself, uh, Dr. Cutlip, Dr. Ho, Dr. Patma, uh, our generation uh, at the BI and the hospital center were deeply involved in these single center studies, and it was megabytes of data. Then we began to do multi-center trials, mega trials of 10 to 20,000 patients. Uh, the data was much bigger, gigabytes of data. But what I'm gonna describe to you now is the giga trial, where it's really powered by patients, it's powered by wearables, it's powered by apps and artificial intelligence. And instead of gigabytes of data, we're now gonna have terabytes of data uh, for uh, analysis. An example of this is the Heartline trial. This is a trial where uh, participants are randomized to either wearing an Apple Watch or not, uh, and there's gonna be 180,000 of them, uh, to test whether the Apple Watch can detect uh, atrial fibrillation. Now, for the main part of the study to come into the study, you do not have atrial fibrillation. The watch is being used to detect atrial fibrillation. I wanna clarify that these people are over 65. Uh, they have somewhere between a three to 4% incidence of new atrial fibrillation, which is very different than the original Apple Heart Study. The other difference from the Apple Heart Study is that we're using a single lead EKG to help make the diagnosis. So there is the uh, arrhythmia detection, the irregular heartbeat detection with the watch. If it triggers you that you may have an irregular rhythm, you then put your finger on the watch, get a single lead EKG that's much higher quality. And that was not done in the Apple Heart Study that goes onto your Apple phone, and then you provide that to your caregiver. So the irregular heartbeat is just a, almost a pre-screening method. The single lead AQG is almost like a screening method. The physician is still in charge in terms of uh, making uh, the diagnosis. So the primary question is, can a wearable you know, as a screening tool, help find uh, silent uh, atrial fibrillation? That's the first question. The second question is, who cares? Uh, does all that we do after that change things? And physicians are free to do whatever they want with that information. Uh, they could choose to give an anticoagulant or not, depending upon the uh, CHAD score and the risk of the patient. But what we will be looking at is heart outcomes all-cause death, all-cause stroke, both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, uh, to see if this approach of finding silent atrial fibrillation and treating it with standard of care doesn't improve outcomes. Now, usually when we do trials of say 10 to 20,000 patients, it costs $1.2 billion. And right now I'm leading a 20,000 patient trial that's costing somewhere near that number. We've had to uh, shut the trial down in some countries. Uh, given the pandemic, it costs a, a million dollars a day while we're idling. Uh, and we really can no longer sustain trials of that size or that expense. This kind of virtual approach will reduce the cost of doing trials to 1%. I think that is absolutely critical. We can get the trials done quicker. We can also get them done, as I say, less expensively. What that means for drug development is that we can have many, many more shots on goal. And what that ultimately means for patients is hopefully a more robust uh, you know, pipeline of new drugs that can enter uh, the marketplace. We'll be replacing bricks and mortar. Uh, this is not a hospital-based trial. Uh, people are not enrolled on paper. Uh, they are not followed up in a clinic uh, or even with electronic case report forms. This is a virtual trial, and uh, patients are uh, enrolled online on an app. Uh, they're followed up by an app, 
and uh, they will be followed up in the claims database. So if you had a stroke, we'll know about it uh, with some degree of sensitivity and specificity, which is to be determined from the claims database. If you're dead, we'll know it from the claims database and other databases. Now, uh, Bobby Ye and his group has done a lot of great work in this area. Uh, you know, perhaps at the end, Bobby can comment on their work about the reliability or lack of reliability of claims databases. But it looks like from some of the TAVR trials, the claims databases approximated the results that you would get if you did uh, adjudication. So for consent, there's not paper consent forms that have been reviewed by your local IRB because the patient is not tethered to a hospital. They're roaming free. The consent process is based on an electronic form. It's global uh, and it's uh, been reviewed and approved by a central IRB. Now in the past, we had enrolled uh, you know, in mega trials, 10 to 20,000 patients. Here we're enrolling up to 180,000 patients. We were very careful to enrich for high risk patients in the past so that we'd have a shot at improving that risk uh, to reduce our sample size. That limited the generalizability of the results. But when you enroll a much broader group of patients, this is a real world sample uh, and may have much more broader generalizability than a traditional randomized trial. Even though we enrolled 10 to 20,000 patients, it was always a nail-biting process to say, oh my gosh, are we gonna have enough patients? Are we gonna be sufficiently powered? Uh, we were always hopeful we'd have just enough patients to test the primary hypothesis, the primary question. Now with this kind of trial, we would be much better powered. We'll definitely answer the primary question, but we may also have enough power to answer many of the secondary questions. And this raises an interesting issue. In the old world, if the trial was statistically significant, well, it was generally clinically significant because the difference had to be big enough to be clinically meaningful. Now in the new world order, the results may be statistically significant, but I think we're gonna to have to ask ourselves, is this a clinically significant difference? Now, the real driver of these trials will be patients and patient empowerment. Uh, you know, in the old days, we would enroll somewhere between 0.3 and one patient per site, per month. And uh, we would be happy if we had um, hundreds of thousands, uh, uh, hundreds of patients rather a month. Now, uh, you know, some of the goals are to enroll once we're up and running again after the pandemic, 50,000 patients uh, per month. Uh, so a much more rapid rate of enrollment. The first day uh, I was in New York City when we launched, the first day we had a thousand patients uh, enrolled uh, in the study just in the first day. The cost will be dramatically reduced. I think many of you may not know that it costs somewhere between 30 and 150,000 patients uh, per patient in trials. Uh, it costs billions of dollars to do some of the bigger study. 40% of the budget is spent on monitoring humans going out, looking to see if what's in the chart matches what is in the electronic case report form. Uh, by eliminating that manpower, we're cutting costs uh, dramatically. We also have complete follow-up. You can run, you can hide, but uh, you can't really get away from the Medicaid, Medicare claims database. You can't get away from the US uh, death registry. There are some delays in that information getting in there, but it's a much more complete way of uh, ascertaining uh, outcomes. And all this is being done for 1% of the usual uh, cost. In the past, you didn't have access to the data from the trial, but now you will have access to your own data. And you can also have family members notified about what's going on with you. If you say, have any regular rhythm detection, uh, they can be uh, notified. I think we're going to have to understand what's going to happen with sensitivity and specificity of our endpoints. Um, I'm not sure how this will play out. I do think uh, some of the work uh, that Bobby has been doing will be useful in comparing how a claims database compares with 
an adjudication database. I was somewhat surprised uh, to see some of the data in uh, the paper show that the claims database had fewer events. I would have expected more events. Uh, and that may drive the event rate down lower than what we expected. So I don't think we know completely uh, yet. When you do a trial, you have a nurse calling the patient. They're very compliant. Uh, but the new way we are going to do this will be much more reflective of uh, compliance out there uh, in uh, the real world. Currently, a lot of hospitals uh, make substantial amount of monies on the labor that's done by nurses and doctors to support trials. But when the patient is doing the work and doing the labor, uh, it makes sense that they should be reimbursed. This has been reversed, reviewed by an army of attorneys and uh, paying people for their work does not represent an inducement uh, to participate. I also wanna make clear that if you can't afford uh, an Apple uh, watch, you can participate in the trial uh, uh, free, the watch is free as a rental and you just have to return it at the end of the trial. Safety monitoring, uh, there's always a delay in safety monitoring in the past, uh, substantial delays, several month delays, uh, while we gathered up all the data. But in this method, I think we'll have much more real-time data uh, with respect to some of the events that can be reviewed by uh, the DSMB. Again, one of the biggest problems in current trials is people go missing, their data goes missing, but again, uh, using a claims database will have much less missingness and much less missing data. When you start to get gigabytes and terabytes of data, uh, you begin to be able to look at that data in new ways using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, you know, in the past, the number of deaths were modest, um, but here you're going to have many, many more events. You can have many, many more uh, data points to allow you to do some modeling. We are moving a little bit away from guidelines-based care to much more personalized care, personalized medicine tailored to every kind of ohm, whether it's the genome or proteome or exposome, and uh, artificial intelligence is gonna play a much bigger role uh, in looking at individual outcomes, not patient level outcomes, to help us with shared decision-making. And uh, this is something we just published recently. Uh, this is your simultaneous risk of bleeding and an ischemic event. In the upper right-hand corner, those who are people who with uh, an agent like rivaroxaban had a reduction in ischemic events and had a reduction in bleeding events. That's where you really wanna be, you know, positive outcomes in both safety and effectiveness. The blue people are the people who had a reduction in ischemic events, but some graded increase in bleeding. What you can see is this kind of information that's being provided here by artificial intelligence on a patient level for an 80 year old Russian with a creatinine in a 2.3, what do you predict is going to happen? For that patient right in front of you right now, you can engage in shared decision making using artificial intelligence and decide, is the risk worth the benefit? It can also be useful in upcoming trials to identify people with the risk that you wanna modify. So what we're going to be doing, hopefully is using artificial intelligence to find the right patients who have the right modifiable risk of both efficacy and safety to kind of optimize uh, you know, the, the trials uh, for benefit. You want to find the center of the bullseye so that we're not just treating everybody. Artificial intelligence is doing uh, amazing things. A lot of imaging studies in particular, maybe not so much in clinical decision making yet, but has really done a lot of uh, important things in the world of imaging. But a word of caution, uh, the associations identified can be spurious. One of my favorite sites uh, goes through and finds all these, you know, acausal associations. Here is the uh, divorce rate plotted against the per capita consumption of margarine, a co coefficient of correlation of 0.99. Uh, we've been down this road before where we've had, um, We've had surrogate endpoints associated with outcomes, 
we modify them, they don't improve uh, outcomes. We have to be careful. We also have to be careful because artificial intelligence is a black box. You often don't know why it's saying the person's going to have a bad outcome. My favorite one is when they really looked into why artificial intelligence was saying someone's going to have a, a bad event from melanoma or not. It turned out that all the artificial intelligence was doing was picking up the presence of a ruler uh, on the image. We have to make sure we're not just identifying a ruler and that uh, we're really uh, using information in a way that makes uh, sense. So I'm gonna wrap up here. I, I think technology is a great tool. We have to make sure though that technology is working for us, that we aren't working for technology as data entry slaves. Uh, healthcare really uh, should not work for technology. Health information, despite what I said about access, does not mean health care. We still have work to do on access there. Uh, I don't think all the tools that you're seeing will compete with uh, physicians, nurses, healthcare providers, but will complement uh, them. But I do hope the open access movement. I do hope that all of us are doing for patient advocacy uh, and patient engagement. I do hope all of that will put the patient back at the center uh, of healthcare in the future. Thanks for joining me today, and I'll stop here and I'll take your questions. Great. So thank you so much, Mike. Uh, we do have one question from Anna, and uh, she may come off of mute to expand on this. Um, how do you achieve a balance between patient-physician advocacy and increasing awareness of issues and supporting your institution? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, be careful. You have to follow um, you know, the rules of the road for your institution when it comes to social media. Don't badmouth your institution. Uh, if you are going to be talking to the media, make sure that your institution knows that you're talking to the media. Uh, I check in uh, with our communications office, let them know what I'm going to be saying. I generally say I'm not going to say anything about the BI in particular. I'm just commenting about healthcare uh, in general. We do, I think, have a responsibility uh, to um, to combat and defeat a lot of the disinformation that's out there. And I do think that's an important role of uh, you as physician educators and physician scientists. When it comes to patient advocacy, uh, it's a very, very tricky issue. Uh, you know, after I advocated for two patients to get compassionate use uh, remdesivir, next thing you know, my direct messaging and email box was just completely flooded uh, with requests. And um, there's, there's certain issues there with respect to equity and who gets access and who does not. Uh, the program was shut off, uh, the open access program or um, uh, compassionate, uh, expanded access or compassionate use program was shut off. And now you have got to be in a trial to get the drug, which I think is a, a legitimate approach to it. Uh, but um, be careful on social media. Be careful uh, that you don't cross the line in advocacy. I don't know if you had a more specific question or example. Uh, I'd be glad to answer that. So Anna mentioned she's having a little bit of trouble with her sound. Um, we do have two other questions that have come in. Uh, the first is from Robert Gersten. How can cost effectiveness be adjudicated in a giga trial? Yeah, cost effectiveness, great, great question. Well, um, we are looking at that, and uh, that is one of the key key endpoints. In fact, it's the um, primary uh, endpoint is a quality of life cost effectiveness uh, endpoint. So we are going to be using uh, claims databases for costs, uh, and we will be looking at the cost of the approach of traditional care and the cost of the approach with the wearable care. Uh, if you can reduce stroke um, and hospitalization, uh, you will hopefully improve uh, care, but also have a cost-effective approach. So definitely looking at that. But I do think the good thing is that all the insurance claims databases uh, do give us access to that kind of cost data. And the Mod Medicare Medicare claims uh, database gives us some uh, insight into the cost of all this. 
Thank you. Uh, a question from Duane. Who owns the data after all of this? Patient, investigators, pros and cons of wide availability vis-a-vis -vis interpretation and quality. Is it better than the current high enroller inside man cabal for data access? Yeah, that's been a big, a big, big, big issue. And um, I was senior author on uh, the open access paper in the New England Journal by a lot of the major trialists around the world. I do think we have to have an approach that accomplishes several goals. One, access. Access uh, to everyone who wants access to the data, as long as they are asking a uh, legitimate uh, hypothesis. Two, that has to be done in a way that safeguards patient privacy. Uh, there is a whole industry of medical identity theft out there. Medical identity theft costs us about 12 to $14 billion a year. If you are someone who um, is a victim of medical identity theft, you're looking at a cost to you personally of $16,000. So we must assure that there can't be re-identification of the patient by what is called an adversary. That's why uh, I think the approach that you're seeing most often and that we advocate is that the database is secure, that uh, access to the database uh, is limited to the question that you want to ask and answer, uh, and that uh, it's curated and that there are gatekeepers from data safety monitoring boards uh, and other uninvolved individuals to, um, to provide that access. So it's an evolving area trying to balance uh, access with protection of patients' privacy. It's an evolving area. Great. So we have a number of questions coming in. Uh, the next two are about specifically patients with atrial fibrillation. So the first is from Warren. Uh, not everyone is in the Medicare database. For example, patients who find they have AF may choose a health plan outside of Medicare as it more favorably, favorably covers the cost of rivaroxaban, um, which is, I guess, more of a comment. But if you have any other uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, you know, we do have uh, limits because some people will do what Warren is describing so but this will be constrained to those people who are in the database not to those people who seek care outside of it. And then a question from Al Buxton. Um, he was hoping you could explain what the control group is for the AF trial and uh, how will you determine that the Apple Watch is responsible for any change in the death or stroke rate rates observed? Yeah so the control group is standard of care. I mean, you don't have an Apple Watch. You aren't perhaps aware that you have asymptomatic or subclinical atrial fibrillation. And, uh, you know, you can go to your doctor's office and they can check your pulse or get an EKG. It might be detected that way. Uh, or you might feel an irregular heart rate. But uh, that is the control group. The active group is the group of the watch and you know i guess it's causal inference i would say to say that if you wear a watch get silent afib detected and get put on the appropriate care if you do see a reduction in events i think uh, from a clinical trials perspective it could be concluded that that is sufficient to indicate that 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 trigger or identification of atrial fibrillation probably led to the improvement in outcomes. We'll of course be comparing what drugs people got in the conventional side to the uh, Apple Watch side to make sure that there wasn't substantial differences in the types of medicines you know, treated, but rather in the proportion of patients who get treated. So a good question. Uh, from Mohs and Chowdhury? Uh, he, he asked, as you mentioned, when you are doing a Google search, Google is searching you. How can we ensure privacy in the area of virtual, in the era of virtual trials? Yeah, well, um, first of all, I want to say, you know, be careful out there with uh, all the footprints you leave out there electronically. Uh, do read, there is a great article in the New York Times that I'd encourage you to all read. Google the word surveillance capitalism. I know I'm telling you to Google something. New York Times and read the article. I think you'll be, I think you'll be more careful after you do that. With respect to this trial, the database is um, 
housed uh, by Apple. Um, it's very, very secure. Uh, you know, the highest levels of encryption and all that goes into that. Uh, Apple is uh, noted for being very good with respect to security and privacy. So this information isn't out there uh, floating around uh, and accessible. Uh, it's it's um, behind uh, a, a secure firewall. Great, um, from Eli Gelfin. Mike, great talk, thank you. How does a busy clinician practically manage his or her involvement in healthcare related social media discussions and what are your tips and tricks? Yeah, well, I'm obviously at one end of the spectrum I kind of carve out, as many of you know, um, the beginning of my day when I get up in the morning, you know, early in the morning, I kind of look at what's going on. And uh, if I see something interesting, I retweet it or comment on it. I try and confine it to a few hours, you know, a few, an hour or so or less in the morning. But for me, my world is one of a lot of conference calls and things. So I have a um, little dashboard on the left and I can see what people in the media are saying. And uh, as I'm kind of participating, I can watch it out the day. But for people who are in a room- I'm sure they'll give us, do you think that they better extend it? But if you're in a room with a patient, you're not gonna do that. But I think the peak times are uh, really um, in the uh, morning. And I'd say another peak time is uh, around 4.30 to 5 when a lot of new things come out. Not as many things comes out at noon. Um, sometimes what we do on weekends is we get things together where we say, everyone who's interested in this problem, we're going to have a discussion Sunday morning, like a journal club, and you can carve out some time there. But I think if you jump on at those peak moments, uh, you, you can benefit. Thank you. So uh, we have a, a lot of great questions coming in. Um, again, from Warren Manning. I'm a big proponent of open access, but I have concerns about posting of preprints online. How does an uninformed reader distinguish truth from fiction? Peer review sometimes results in a different analysis with the change in the results or identification of the conclusion is not supported by the presented data. Yeah, well, the other day I said, you know, the preprint process, it's almost like you need a driver's license uh, to drive, you know, to drive a preprint. Um, I think there are benefits and uh, dangers or perils. I think uh, Warren points out one of them. Uh, I guess we have to be very careful. I think we have to do a better job of alerting patients to the fact that this has not been vetted by experts yet. On the other hand, um, I can tell you, you know, people get totally flamed uh, on the internet uh, commenting on these preprints. So there's very aggressive commentary about them. And there are numerous instances now where the preprint was not published. It was withdrawn because of the ferocity of the criticism. But uh, Warren is right, that ferocity of criticism, the reader, the lay reader may not see that uh, and may not be aware of it. Hopefully there's nothing out there on a preprint that's going to, but this may not be true. Hopefully there's nothing that's gonna change a lay person's approach uh, to medical care, but you never know. Um, that's one of, the, one of the riskier things. Perhaps we, need, perhaps we need two different types of preprint servers. Perhaps we need ones that are related to science, but Warren, maybe we need another type or level of preprint server that contains information that could be sensitive to uh, patients and their care. And it should come with more bells and whistles before you see it, uh, you know, to let you know the dangers of acting on this information. What I do feel strongly about though, is that, you know, two or three people who have a uh, conflicted interest as reviewers, I don't think that's uh, necessarily the be all of peer review. I do think a global peer review process is probably uh, very, very important. Thank you. One additional comment from Warren. Once a preprint is out there, it is available. Um, and just noting that hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19 may be an example of this um, to, to, to everyone's point. Um, at, we have just two last questions. We'll take these no, as the but, last one. No, but, but there's several preprints out there saying it doesn't work. And in fact, um, uh, you know, so there's, there's data going the other way. So I, I wouldn't say that this has fueled necessarily the positive 
uh, approach to this. In fact, there's data suggesting caution. So we'll take just two last questions in the sake of time and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, the first is from Hassan Kazmi. Will open access website Wikiduc educate on clinical trials in the future? Well, we embed it in clinical trials at this point. So we embed uh, the, the wiki into the clinical trials that we're doing, so yes. And our last question from Peter Zimitbaum. Mike, how do you decide when to test a new technology? As you know, the Apple Watch and Cardio device are still very limited in AF detection accuracy. And a continuation of the question, um, they will result in a lot of unnecessary physician visits. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I think, again, I try to use the words very carefully. I don't think the watch is intended to make a diagnosis. It's used as a screening tool, almost a pre-screening tool. The watch is then used to get a single lead EKG, which is a screening tool. And then the diagnosis is made by the doctor. So we aren't replacing the doctor. We are simply, um, you know, complimenting the doctor and alerting the doctor. You don't need to see the doctor uh, to make that diagnosis. The patient can provide you that single EDKG uh, you know, over the internet and you could review it. Uh, you don't have to necessarily come to the office. In the Apple Heart study of about 400,000 patients, there was not an avalanche of uh, people uh, coming to the emergency room. And I'll also say with an implantable device, an implantable device that detected ST elevation that I ran for 17 years to detect ST elevation in my, actually, there was less resource utilization with the implantable device and fewer false positive presentations with the implantable device than without. So by complementing symptoms, you actually could turn down resource utilization. Uh, so it's it's an interesting thing. It's not what I would have predicted. That's fantastic. So thank you so much. We'll wrap up this discussion. Um, thank you again to Mike for, for a very stimulating uh, presentation and, and interactive discussion. Um, and we'll see everyone uh, next, next week for Grand Rounds. Great. Thanks, guys.